hours, Devin, you can see soon we're going to not be able to see all the other hours, and so I, I want to remind you of this. We're exploring Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah is not the longest book in the Old Testament. Surprisingly, Jeremiah has more words than the other books in the Bible. Most people don't know that. They think of Psalms as the longest book. But when you count the actual words, the Hebrew words, Jeremiah is the longest, but Isaiah is up there. It's huge. Uh, but Isaiah is affirmed. The message I'm sharing with you is affirmed because Jesus believed Isaiah. Uh, all of the New Testament writers, 23 of the books of the New Testament, quote Isaiah. And so God really is saying to us, you trust the Bible like I do. Uh, it describes the culture abandoned um, to their sin. Did you know the worst thing God can do to you is let you just do what you want to do? Have you ever thought about that? Everybody thinks. If I could just do anything I want to do. There's a whole chapter in the Bible written about that. Romans chapter 1. What happens to a culture that just does whatever they want to do? And that's what's happening right now in our culture. Uh, Bonnie and I were reading yesterday a uh, uh, New York Times article about a, a city where we served nine years. It, it's called, it's, a, it's an Indian uh, tribal name. It's called Kalamazoo. What an amazing name for a city. New York Times sent their reporters to Kalamazoo to go through the homeless encampments along the Kalamazoo River to check how many different forms of drugs the homeless people were taking. They offered free medical testing. And basically, the whole you can read it in New York Times. It's, it's the feature article yesterday. The whole thing said that our culture is degenerating so much that nobody takes one drug. That's what a culture that, that God says it, he has abandoned. He's allowing people to do whatever they want to do. And it's horrible. So how are we supposed to reach them? And I, immediately I thought of all the ministries I know in that area that are reaching out, that, that feed those people, that take... Uh, supplies to them, that offer shelter to them, that offer interdiction for their, their drug addictions. Consecration. That's how God wants us to reach a dying culture. And I'm looking forward to chapel today because I'm going to share with you a summary of Paul's life. Paul teaches us the lessons of how to have a life that's effective, how to have a life that, that counts for eternity. And Part of Paul's testimony is right there, that consecration, hour three. Then the, the theme of the whole Bible, the Bible is, is about God. And God reveals himself through Christ. And so the Messiah is the person who fulfills all those promises God has made. Then we looked at God's wrath on the earth that's coming. Uh, he's already put a lot of wrath on the earth, but the big one is coming. Also, we pulled back the curtain that Isaiah uh, pulls back of the cosmic warfare, but now we're looking at justice. How does God and when does God respond to national sins? Have you ever thought about that? How long will God let someone do bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff? Now, Jesus addressed this personally. Do you remember he said when Peter said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my, my brother? Three times? And the Lord said, no, 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 70 times seven. Now that shows how, how merciful the Lord is. Now you understand the difference between mercy and grace, right? You've covered that. Mercy is when we don't get what we deserve. Grace is when we do get what we don't deserve. It's an amazing interplay there. Of, and both of them have to do with God's justice. God's justice is no sin goes unpunished. Now look, aren't these a bunch of familiar names? Look, look at these national people group names I've listed up. These are who we're going to cover. See, we're covering Isaiah 15 to 23, 28 to 35. You say, well, what are we leaving out? Well, right there, we covered uh, Isaiah uh, 24 to 27, the little apocalypse in 13 about Babylon. Then we paused with Lucifer, but now we're going back to that whole spread. And here it is. It's a collection of nations that God dealt with. And it's fascinating as, as we go through them. So the context is this. 
We're living the perfect peace life, Isaiah 26, 3, in the midst of a crumbling world, and a crumbling world is a world that has sins that are piling up. In this slide, uh, I, I gave you two references. Do you guys know Galatians 6, be not deceived, God is not mocked. What does that say? Whatsoever a person, yeah, sows they'll also reap. Yeah, it's called the Galatians 6 is the sowing right here, the sowing and reaping verse. And God says, whatever you're sowing, you're going to reap. Now, I watched uh, when we were driving yesterday, they're planting something here. Uh, they're always planting something on Jeju, but they were really planting something yesterday. And they were, uh, all of them had these round tubs and these, they just look like green uh, sticks or something, little tiny things. And they were putting them in the ground. Whatever they're sowing, they're going to reap. That's what Galatians 6 says. You know what Hosea 8 says? Israel sowed to the wind and reaped a whirlwind. You know what that means? It's like throwing dust in the air and the wind blows it back at you and it's worse. Now, that's happening. If today's New York Times article is about valley fever. You ever heard of valley fever? I'm not talking about the people in California that have the valley fever and they want to be a movie star. I'm talking about an actual fungus that grows in people's lungs from dust in dry places. It's terrible. You ever seen a dust storm where the wind blows through and it blows a cloud of dust? When you breathe that in, in the dust are little spores of a fungus, you know, of fungi. Uh, the, one of the largest living things on our planet are all these mushrooms and, and lichens and all this. They're all related to each other. Well, they sporulate. They puff out puffs of little tiny spores. They just get in the soil. And when the wind blows the soil up into a dust storm, people breathe it in and they start having this. It's, right now it's called valley fever because it's usually in agricultural valleys that are dry and dusty and it blows through. But what the Lord says is, when you sow to the wind, when you throw something in the wind, it comes back to you in a whirlwind. So that, this whole seventh class is about the death of a nation. What nation is it? What nation is the book of Isaiah about? Israel. The whole thing is about why the people that God rescued out of Egypt, do you realize Egypt, when God rescued them, was at their zenith? They were the most powerful nation in the world of all. And God went in and destroyed their army. How did he destroy their army? Drowned them when they came in to the crossing of the Red Sea. God, before he drowned them, what did he do to their chariots? Do you remember? He pulled their wheels off. I mean, it was, how would you like God fighting for you? I mean, there is nothing that could stand against him. When all the nations came, God would send hailstones down. Whatever it took, uh, God protected Israel. He wanted them to be his people. But look what happens to him. The death of the nation. Why? Because God's justice, he will let no sin go unpunished. He's very patient, which means he waits and waits and waits and waits. But his wrath builds up. So basically, this would be how I summarize the, this first part, starting in chapter 15. God is watching. Every one of the nations we're going to cover in today's class, Moab, Philistia, Syria, Babylon, Elam, Media, and so on. All of these, Moab, Egypt, Philistia, Babylon, Syria, Edom, Ethiopia, Arabia, Tyre, that was the Phoenicians. They were the wealthiest nation on earth at their prime. Unbelievable. Till Alexander the Great wiped them out. Jerusalem and Israel and Assyria, all of these nations are now extinct, except for one. Is there a Moab today? No. Philistia? No. We have Palestinians, but we don't have Philistines. Assyrians? No. You know, I used to say that all the time. One of the places Bonnie and I serve and teach is in Jordan, you know, the country of Jordan. There's a seminary there. 
It's called Jordanian Evangelical Theological Seminary. And I said, I was teaching just like this to seminary students. And I said, and there's no nation of Assyria. And I heard a noise. And about three of the students went, we're Assyrians. I said, what? They said, yeah. There is the Assyrian Orthodox Church. And we're Assyrians. We live in Mosul. Do you know what city that is? Nineveh. It's still there. So the Assyrian nation that, that we talk about is gone, but there are still people living in that geographic area, but they're not a nation. They just identify with it. So I, I'm cautious now when I say there are no Assyrians because there were in seminary. By the way, they were church planters in Iraq going to seminary. Do you know what they did? Uh, this boggles me. They did tent evangelism. That's how they plant churches in Iraq, in Syria, uh, in, in some parts of Jordan. They actually put up a tent, put chairs in it, put up a place to stand, bring the Bible, and in Arabic preach about Jesus Christ. And the Muslims come because Jesus is in the Quran and they don't know much about him and they want to hear about him and they testify about him. And they lead people to Christ and they plant churches in Iraq, in Syria, uh, in Egypt. I mean, that's, I have to be very careful, but I am, I am talking about what we're covering. Another group I taught at this were Egyptian church planters. And I said, you plant churches in Egypt? They said, yep. And they said, but it's really hard. I said, tell me about it. And they said, we meet in homes. We have house churches. I said, wonderful. They said, well, the problem is the Egyptian government, it's illegal to have Christian churches in your house. But we do it because we have to meet. And so we, we decide whose house the church service is going to be in. And the government finds out. And do you know what the government does when they find a Christian church in an Egyptian home? They come with the police and they tell them to get out of the house and empty out anything you want and they burn the house down right then because it is not allowed to use an Egyptian home for a house church. I said, what happens then? He said, oh, we already have a plan. You know, if, if you know, Stitch's house gets burned, we've already decided that Stitch can go you know, and live with one of you, her whole family. They carry all their stuff over and they live there. I said, really? Yeah, and they've decided, all of them have decided, that if your house gets burned, you can come live in our house. And he said, the church is thriving. I said, do people actually sign up to host the services? Can you imagine that? How would you like if, if your parents, if they knew that the, the government found out that they were going to burn your house down, would you volunteer to have the church? 99% Christians. Mm -mm. I'm not going to lose my house. And, and that's the level. You talk about commitment. What I see in Western churches in America and, and other places we travel, the commitment levels down here. We want to go to heaven. We want our sins forgiven. We don't want to suffer. We want to go to heaven. We want to have our sins forgiven. We don't want to suffer. Do you know what I see overseas? We want to go to heaven. We want our sins forgiven. And we'll do anything for the Lord that's possible. Now, just a little aside. God is watching. Which does he see in your life today? Are you one of those, I want my sins forgiven, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to suffer? Or are you saying, Lord, whatever you want from me, I'm going to offer it. I'm going to give it to you. God is watching. Well, in their days... Each of these ruled the world or their little part of it. I mean, Moab was huge. Moab was an exporting, agricultural, military country. Egypt, I mean, we still, that's probably one of the biggest draws in museums around the world. Get anything from Egypt, you'll get a crowd. I mean, it fascinates us to see the pharaohs and the pyramids and all that stuff. Philistia? Philistia had mechanized olive production. They produced millions of, 
of exported olive uh, flask of oil. They just were um, amazing. Babylon, I mean, we've all heard of Babylon and, and all the, the city of Babylon. Syria, Syria has the longest inhabited city in the world, still today, Damascus. Edom, that's where, of course, we know Esau was from, Petra. I mean, everybody likes to go to Petra. Even Indiana Jones went there, right? Uh, as he rode in through the sea. It's big time. Their culture is amazing. Ethiopia, I mean, Ethiopia today is a poverty-ridden country. Do you know what it was? If you go through any major, you go through the Louvre or you go through the British Museum, Ethiopia has almost as many pyramids as Egypt does. It's just you've never heard of them or seen them because they're all covered with sand. Nobody's bothered to excavate them all. Amazing, huge, powerful. Their army, they sent an army, the Bible says, of a million soldiers against Israel, against King Asa, but it's not in Isaiah, so I won't cover it. Arabia, you all know Saudi Arabia, but the Arabian tribes, Tyre, I told you it was the wealthiest country in the world. All of them ruled their part of it. And all of these countries, including Israel, ignored God's justice. His patience ended, and he unleashed his wrath. And one by one, they were destroyed. Why is Israel still existing? Because God sovereignly elected them. He chose them. He says, I'm not choosing you because you're the biggest. I'm not choosing you because you're the best. I'm not choosing you because you're righteous. I just pick you. And Satan knows that. So uh, let's, let's go to chapter 17 because uh, we'll walk to 17. Look at chapter 15. Chapter 15 is the proclamation against Moab. Moab is on the east side of the Dead Sea. So if you think of a map, think of the Sea of Galilee, think of the Dead Sea, move east, Moab is right there. And Edom goes below it. So in Bible, uh, chronology, or Bible geography, up here is Gilead. Here's the Sea of Galilee. Gilead, Ammon, Moab, Edom. That spells something. G-A-M-E. If you ever want to remember Bible geography, the other side of the Jordan is Gilead, G, Ammon, the Ammonites, A, Moab, down there by the, across from the, the Dead Sea, Moab is M, and Edom is south of that. And that's how you always pass your Bible geography quiz when you're in seminary. So Moab is chapter 15, and look what it says. The burden against Moab. That's how each of these chapters start. And then chapter 16 is all about Moab getting destroyed. And how glad, verse 10 of chapter 16, gladness is taken away. And they're, they're just, verse 13, the word which the Lord spoken concerning Moab. Boom, you're gone. Now chapter 17, the burden against Damascus. Why would God devote a whole chapter to one of the greatest cities of the ancient world because he wants to talk to us about his plans. God predicts that Damascus is going to be destroyed. Very clearly in chapter 17, look at verse 1. The burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. And on and on it goes all the way through chapter 17. Do you know what people that don't believe the Bible say? There is an example of part of the Bible that's not true. Damascus is the most long, the longest continuously inhabited city in the world. Well, right here, I have a whole slide about that. That's what's on there. If you go there as a tourist, that's what's on the brochure. You know, like Jeju, they say we have the Jeju oranges. Is that what they call them, the orange, or do they have another name for them? Tangerines, Tangerines. there we go. So it's the Jeju tangerines. Do you know what Damascus's brochure is? The oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. The oldest continuously inhabited. Damascus was founded and settled by the Arameans. Now, for just a minute, let me show you how practical the Bible is. Look in Genesis chapter 10. If you ever want to know what's going on in the world, find out what God says about them, and you'll know what's going on in the world. Chapter 10 of Genesis, 
are the nations that descended from Noah. So Noah is the only human, Noah and his three sons and their wives and Noah's wife, left alive on earth after the flood. You all know that. That's what the Bible says. And that's what Jesus believed. He believed all of us are descended from Noah. So you all, you know, all this genealogy stuff, everybody's signing up for 23andMe and Ancestry.com and all that stuff. I can trace my genealogy all the way back to Noah. So can you. Everybody can. But look at verse 22. Uh, the sons of Shem. Now for just a minute, think about this. Here we have Noah here, and Noah had three sons. Do you all remember these from Sunday school? Shem. Who's the other one? Ham. And who's the other one? Japheth. Have you ever thought they, they lived 500 years after the flood? At the flood, these three boys were about 100 years old if you read the genealogies. They lived at least 500 years after the flood. Where did Japheth live? Anybody ever paid, paid attention? Japheth, the city is almost named after him. It's called Joppa, or they call it Jaffa with an F. Ham. Ham became all those, the Canaanites. They're Hamitic. You've heard of the Canaanites, you know, the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Termites, you know, and all those, right? You know all of the, the tribes of Canaan. Where did Shem go? Well, if you read the history, the Arameans are descended, descended from Aram. Look at verse 22 of chapter 10. The sons of Shem were Elam... Asher, I already covered that, the Asher were the Assyrians, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram, A-R-A-M. So Shem's family, one of his sons were, was named Aram, and Damascus is the capital city of the Arameans and of the language Jesus spoke. What language did Jesus speak? the common language of the day? Aramean. That was the, the trade language before Koine Greek. And so in the Middle East, they spoke Aramaic based on Aram. But what does that have to do with anything? Well, throughout history, Damascus, before it was Damascus, was called Dimshak, and before that it was called Sham. In the ancient times, it actually refers to the fact that as far as we know, that's where Shem settled. With He must have liked that son. You know how parents, when they get old, they stay around family members they like? They went to Aram. Damascus is an emerald green oasis set in the sands of the, of the desert. What does the Bible say? Damascus will cease to exist. That's verse 1. Verse 13. So back from Genesis to uh, Isaiah. Verse 13. The nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them and chase like the chaff and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Do you know what Jeremiah adds to that? Jeremiah adds that the walls, the brick walls of Damascus will melt. Have any of you ever been out into the deserts of New Mexico to see the atomic bomb test site? Alamogordo, it's called. It's very hard to get to. If you go out there, the desert is all sand. You're driving up and, you know, tumbleweeds and everything. And all of a sudden you come and it looks like glass. What happened? What would melt sand into glass just like that? That was the first atomic bomb. Atomic bombs get as hot as the surface of the sun. It melts dirt rocks, sand, and just makes it like glass. Do you know what the Bible says is going to happen in Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah, chapter 49? That Damascus will cease from being a city, will be taken away. By the way, something happened, uh, not quite in your lifetime. Most of you 
were born after 2001, right? Most of you are younger than that. All of us lived through that. It was a very, very scary time. Saddam Hussein. That's a name you don't hear very often anymore. He, well, I'll just read you the news article. An event on February 16, 2001 was an event too close for comfort. For those of you who think the horrific event of Damascus could not occur of it ceasing to exist, brace yourselves. On one occasion, almost did, February 16, 2001, the combined American-British air raid against the Command Control Center of Iraq, 20, north, 20 miles north of Baghdad, was striking a preemptive strike on Saddam Hussein. A few days later, the U.S. satellites picked up six Iraqi divisions moving westward toward Israel, including all of Saddam's ground-to-ground -ground missile equipment. The intelligence community estimated they would be ready to be launched Thursday evening, February 16, 2001. The U.S. and the Israeli government issued grave warnings to the Syrian government. There was a massive Palestinian terror attack planned and being programmed as the start. Doesn't that sound like what we just went through on October? It's, this is just going over and over, this, this eternal enmity, the Bible calls it, that, that Satan has for Israel, and he stirs up the nations. Well, Syrian President Bashar Assad granted position for Saddam's six Iraqi divisions to be deployed on the Syrian-Iraqi border. He gave Hezbollah, there's another name from the news, the okay to unleash their long-range rocket attacks against northern Israel, the U.S. and Israeli governments issued grave warnings to the Syrian government, and a message was sent through Tony Blair. Listen to this. You know, Tony Blair was the head, the premier or prime minister of England. He contacted through diplomatic channels Saddam Hussein and said, there would be neutron bombs destroying six Iraqi divisions, and Israel will use low-yield nuclear strikes on both Damascus and Baghdad. They would push the launch button at 7.30 p.m. February 16, 2001. Now, nobody knew about that except the intelligence community, the American military, president, you know, Congress and all that, the British parliament, the key members, and of course, Syria and Iraq. Israel came within inches of melting Baghdad. By the way, Saddam, if you know history, he backed down. He pulled his missiles back. He did shoot one, and it made it all the way to Tel Aviv, but just one, just to show he could do it. But look what's going on. The next time, Syria might not back down. Russia is their ally. Russian troops are right now installing in Damascus the most advanced air defense system in the world. They now have missiles provided by Russia and North Korea that can strike within 40 feet of any target in Israel from top to bottom. That means the Knesset, that means Daimona, the nuclear reactor, it means Haifa, and everything else. Because of Israel's nuclear attack on Damascus, that may be what Isaiah 17 describes. It would set off the events we see in the tribulation where the Antichrist has to guarantee their safety. Okay, so keeping on. So we've only talked about right there, Syria and Damascus, and we talked about Moab. Look, look at what God says starting in chapter 18. Woe to the land shadowed with buzzing wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. That's Ethiopia. Verse, that's verse 1 of chapter 18. Look at chapter 19. The burden against Egypt. So what we have, and then chapter 20, is about Assyria. The impending conquest of Egypt and Ethiopia. Who conquered them? Well, chapter 19, 1 to 15, talks about it being conquered. Who did it? Assyria was the first one. Babylon followed. Greece followed. They took over. Uh, Egypt, and finally Rome ended the pharaohs. So everybody else let the pharaohs keep going, but Rome took over and said, you can't even have a pharaoh. But look at chapter 20, and that's the next thing I want to show you. In that year, the one that's going to conquer Egypt came to Ashdod, 
Sargon, king of Assyria. Now, that's the only mention of Sargon in the Bible. He gets one time, and not even his full title, just one name. Did you know he was the greatest king of his moment in the ancient world? In fact, I want to show you. Let me get you there. I'll just take 30 seconds and let you see. Uh, this, this is Sargon's palace. It's called Korsabad. It's in the British Museum. These are the Lamassus. Look at these giant winged human-headed bulls. They have five legs so that you always see them either standing or like they're, they're moving. And this, well, you, I don't take you around, but around the corner is the most amazing collection of sculptures you've ever seen. This is Sargon. He was, he was like Putin and Xi put together, the most famous ancient ruler. Do you know what happened to him? He went conquering all these nations I, I'm reading about here. And in the middle of his conquest, he was killed in battle. Unexpectedly, I might add. The Assyrians didn't lose. They were not able to recover his body. The Assyrian troops were so defeated in that battle, they retreated, and Sargon was left on the battlefield. Do you know who his son was? The one we're going to meet next hour. Sen Sargon's son was Sennacherib. Because in their tradition, when someone isn't buried, they don't get to go to paradise. They wander forever. That, that drove Sennacherib, and we're going to see that next hour. But basically, he had a sad ending. And Isaiah 13 and 21 and 22 go on to say, uh, if, if you look at um, the proclamation against Egypt in 2021 is against Babylon. Uh, let me show you what happened real quickly. Uh, Babylon is right here. And the Babylonian Empire comes up and conquers the Assyrian Empire. And you all know Babylon and Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach. You all know that in the Bible. But after just a few generations of Babylonian kings... The Medo-Persians, this whole area, comes and conquers Babylon. And after just a few generations of, of those Persian kings, here comes Alexander the Great, and he takes them all, and Egypt too. And then what happens after another 200 years? The Romans come. So basically, everybody listed in this First gets conquered by Assyria, then gets conquered by Babylon, then gets conquered by Medo-Persia, then gets conquered by Greece, and then all of them get conquered by Rome. Well, let's go to chapter 22, because the reason I want to show you chapter 22 is uh, this person that's mentioned in verse 15. And the reason this is important is this person shows up, or this event, in Revelation. Did you know Jesus tells the church that he doesn't criticize, Philadelphia, in chapter 3 of Revelation, he said, if you follow me, let me read to you, Revelation 3. When I teach Revelation, I love, I love teaching on Philadelphia. It's the church that Jesus said, you're doing it just right. If you ever want to read a part of the Bible, that's comforting. It's the church Jesus has nothing to criticize. He said, you Philadelphians, you're doing everything I want you to do. You know? You ever had someone, you're, you're doing your job, you're mopping or cleaning up or cooking or doing the dishes or whatever, you're on cabin cleaning crew, and the boss goes, good job. You go, oh, that's what Jesus did to Philadelphia. And listen to what he says. It's Revelation 3.7. To the angel in church in Philadelphia, write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true. Now look at the next phrase. He who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. That's Revelation 3, 7. Now look in Isaiah 22, verse 22. It says, well, I'll back up to... Uh, uh, Verse, well, I guess I'll just read 22 or I'll never get done. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. He will open and no one will shut. And he will shut and no one will open. 
I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place. What does Isaiah 22, 22 have to do with Revelation? It all goes back to verse 15 of Revelation 20, or I mean of Isaiah 22. And it goes back to this guy. Look at, look at verse 15. Sheb now. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, go proceed to the steward, Shebna, who is over the house, and say. Now let me read this to you. It's possible to many of us, this Old Testament description of the key of David in Isaiah 22, 22 seems remote. Shebna, that, that guy, in Isaiah 22, God says he's the steward of the house and he has a key, the key of David, to open and no one can close, and close and no one can open, and we go, what is all that? He was the steward. Shebna was the steward of the king. What does that mean? Kings didn't do everything. It's kind of like our politicians. Did you ever see the time Obama went out and he didn't know how to put gas in the car? That was one of those curious moments. Why would the President of the United States not know how to take the gas pump and stick it in the side of the car? Because someone did it for him all the time. That's how the, the busy people of the world operate. That's how the kings of Israel operated. So Shebna was the king's steward. Shebna ran his calendar. You wanted to see the king? You didn't supposed to see the king. You talked to Shebna. Shebna's the one that had the credit card. He's the one that signed the checks. He was the king's steward. He did all that. They called the steward the one who holds the key of David. David was the first of the kings of the righteous kings after Saul, the unrighteous king. And so they, they call it the key of David. Now, Revelation says it's really Jesus. Jesus is the king. Jesus dispenses the king's wealth, God the Father, opens the door to the king's presence, God the Father, Jesus opens the way. So Shebna became very famous in Isaiah 22, 22. When they started excavating Jerusalem, Guess what? There is the lintel with Shebna's name on it. This is in the British Museum. It's so famous. This inscription says, inside my tomb, and see someone hacked a hole in it. And right here is the inscription. Silwan, King Hezekiah's steward, Shebna. There's his name. It's right on the wall of the museum. Shebna built a huge tomb for himself, and it became conspicuous because it appeared he was taking some of Hezekiah's money. He couldn't have afforded that huge computer. Uh, and I don't want you to get motion sickness, so I'll go on. But that's an amazing thing to think about, that in the midst of all this, Jesus pulls out chapter 22 and uses it in Revelation. Okay, we have 10 minutes. Let's talk about Tyre. Go to chapter 23. The burden against Tyre, T-Y-R-E. Whale, you ships of Tarshish. Where did Jonah want to go? He got in a boat going to where? Tarshish. Where's Tarshish? We would call it Spain today. Who could get you from Israel to Spain anytime you wanted? Where could you buy a ticket? The Phoenicians. Where are the Phoenicians headquartered? Tyre. Tyre was the proudest and most prosperous city on earth in this time period. They were the emporium of the world. Their markets bulged with gold and precious stones from all over the world. And what does the Lord say in Isaiah 23, in 740 BC to 680, that Tyre is going to be destroyed? Were they destroyed? Five times people attack Tyre. What God said right here, in chapter 23, that all, verse 14, your strength will be laid waste. It didn't happen until Alexander came along. He was the fifth. And see, Tyre was on an island. And here's the mainland. And all of these countries, Assyria came through, the Babylonians came through, the other nations came through, and they all were on the shore and they were throwing their spears and shooting arrows, and they would try and go out in boats. But the people of Tyre had an impregnable island with walls all the way around it, and they had all their boats in these harbors. And when people got too close, they'd sail away and take everything with them. So what did Alexander do? 
he came and destroyed all of the coastal uh, housing that was on the coast, all of the businesses that were there, and built a mole, an M-O-L-E. That's kind of like a causeway. And he built it out, and his army marched across, and in 332, he destroyed, just like Isaiah said and Ezekiel said, what God says is going to happen. The same thing in chapter 28. Look at chapter 28. And by the way, that's one of the greatest prophetic fulfillments in history. But in 28, it says, woe to Ephraim. That's the northern tribes. And it says, Assyria is going to come. I'm not even going to spend the time. They came, remember? They impaled all the people of Ephraim on pales, uh, poles. Then look at chapter 29. Jerusalem is warned. There's going to be a woe against Jerusalem. Woe to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Ariel, that's code for Jerusalem. Jerusalem's worn. Did Jerusalem get destroyed? Yes, the Babylonians came and did it. Now we get to chapter 30. Uh, when, when Israel is facing uh, the Assyrians, who do they turn to? They go to Egypt. What is Egypt always a picture of? Going to the world, going back to the idols. But what does God say in chapter 33? Now, we're going to close uh, on Friday our whole... Um, week of studying Isaiah in chapter 33. But Isaiah 33, if you haven't finished all your devotionals, it's the best, most beautiful chapter devotionally. It talks about, here's what it's about, verse 17 of chapter 33. This is what God told Jerusalem through Isaiah, the Assyrians are coming, the Babylonians are coming, in the future I'm going to deliver you, but how do you endure your world crumbling? Verse 17. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty, and they will see the land that is very far off. That's a promise of seeing Christ as the majestic king. We'll come back to that on the last day, uh, spend the whole hour on it. Now look at Isaiah 34. This is the last of these, these nations uh, that are going through. And in 34, verse 4, we find a little talk about how in the future, God's going to reconcile with everybody. The host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. You ever heard that before? That's the description of the tribulation. You see, Isaiah, and I, I'm not going to show you the slide again, but Isaiah keeps looking from right here and now and the Babylonians and the Egyptians, and he looks off and he keeps talking about that ultimate event which you see it's Revelation 6.14, when that great earthquake at the end of the tribulation hits. But he doesn't end there. Look at Isaiah 35 now and verse 8. He says this, A highway shall be there, a highway of holiness. The ransom of the Lord, verse 10, will come to Zion with singing. When is that? That's the millennium. You see, Isaiah goes back and forth between the Babylonians and the Egyptians coming, and the future event of the millennium. And that's called the kingdom blessings for Israel. You can read about it there. Let me summarize them. If I was, if you were in our Revelation class, Revelation 20, the whole chapter is about the thousand-year rule of Christ. What is the millennium? It's a time after Jesus descends from heaven and lands, his feet touch the Mount of Olives, and the mountain splits and all the armies are incinerated and he sets up shop and ruling. This is what he does. Zechariah and Isaiah say the whole earth starts changing. God doesn't remove the curse of sin, but he lifts it. Isaiah 11 talks about it. Creation is redeemed. It's waiting for this moment. The earth, Isaiah says, and Habakkuk is full of the Lord. Death and sin are limited. Do you know during the millennium, no one will die unless they're bad? Everyone will live a thousand years. You'll be healthy. There are no hospitals during the millennium. There are no poisonous snakes. There are no spiders, no scorpions, no carnivorous animals. Uh, lions, that's where Isaiah talks about lions and lambs, you know, the bear and the calf, all that stuff. A child will stick their hand into the, the den of a viper and, and the viper won't bite it. God, God rolls back the curse, not completely, 
Why, why do we know it's not completely? Well, Satan, we'll see next hour, is still alive and his demons, but Satan is confined to chains in the pit and he's not allowed out. Uh, everything will be fruitful. Everybody will have enough food. All, I mean, it's what everybody wants. Pure air, pure water, pure soil. In fact, I just read... Uh, it's 100% now, microplastics, all of us have microplastics in our blood because we're breathing it in. So it's the first time in history humans now have bits of what we would call pollution, microplastics, nanoparticles, are found in every single blood draw in every hospital around the world. It's from the top of the Himalayas to the bottom of the ocean. There's plastic everywhere. God is going to solve all that, and everybody's going to have their own land, everyone's going to be healthy, and God is going to reign. What is the lesson about God's trying to tell us? That people are responsible. Romans says everybody is born into this world with two candles in their hands. I, I've taught this all my life, uh, going through seminary, I've heard this in, Revela or in Romans 1, and I couldn't wait for our first son to be born, Johnny. And I was right there wearing my gown, my mask on. The doctor was there telling me I was assisting in the birth of my son. I wanted to see his candles because the Bible says everybody's born holding two candles. But it's, it's metaphoric. He wasn't holding any candles. He was just screaming and, you know, purplish red and, and all. And I was disappointed. But what are the two candles? Conscience. God gives everybody a lit candle of conscience. And if you follow that candle, it will light your way for you to know how to find God. You understand that? Conscience is God's ally that's inside of everyone else. Everyone also has a second candle, creation. If you look out and you see the symmetry and the beauty and the orderliness and everything and the colors and the variety and just the complexity of a, the eye of a fly, is more complex than the F-35, you know, America's billion dollar fighter program. So what do people do with their, their candles? They blow out the conscience one by saying, I don't care, I'm gonna sin and sin and sin. And then they say there's no creator and they blow that one out and they're left to themselves and they become wicked and God's watching. And God lets them go, he's patient, but his justice sends his wrath. And that's what we're supposed to know to live in our crumbling world. Have a great break. Mm -hmm.